When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Money is one of the leading causes for divorce. Why? Because we don't like to talk about it, not when we're dating, not when we're engaged, and certainly not when we're married. Can we change the divorce rate if we just started talking about money? Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. Hey, it's Shauna here with some really exciting news. You can now listen to our entire back catalog completely ad free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. Check out all your favorite episodes of Millennial Money, like How to Finally Master the Art of Budgeting. In addition to the Millennial Money Archive, you can also listen to every new episode ad-free, as well as tons of other ad-free Wondery shows with hundreds of hours of original content, audio documentaries, and exclusive bonus episodes from some of your favorite podcasts. You can sign up now for a free month of Stitcher Premium by going to stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery and using the promo code Wondery. Then once you're signed up, you just download the Stitcher app for iOS or Android and start listening. That's stitcherpremium.com slash Wondery in promo code Wondery. Have you ever had this fight? So I sat across from a couple and I was helping them out with their finances and the first words out of his mouth were, but you can't even imagine what she spends money on. And then she said, oh yeah, what about all that dumb stuff you spend money on? I mean, come on. And they went back and forth until one of them just got up and left the table. Fights over money are going to happen. I can't even sugarcoat that for you. They're just going to happen. But so many of them can be avoided if we just learn how to talk about money with our spouse. Today's guest, Dan Hines, is helping couples do just that. He's a financial coach and the mastermind behind Adulting with Money and the author of the ebook, How to Talk About Money with Your Spouse, The Ultimate Guide. So Dan, I got to ask you, why is it so hard to talk to your honey about money? 
Yes, that's a good question. Well, I think especially in this day and age and the way society has has changed is that we as adults uh, usually are using our money on our own for years before we get engaged or get married. And so we we tend to start to use our money our way. <laughs> and then when you start to try to uh, to work with someone else and, and, and combine that, it starts to get a bit difficult. And I think it's hard to get together and to start to talk about money because it can be very personal. And it's also the way you grow up and the way your family has handled money versus the way someone else's has handled money, your spouse or your engaged betrothed, and just how things happen. I mean, it's not quite as bad as maybe political parties, but it's just <laughs> like when you've when you've grown up as a Republican and your spouse has grown up as a Democrat, you just think differently. And so you have to be very careful, but you can definitely still get along in the in the long run. Yeah, you mentioned political parties. That's fascinating because when my husband and I were first dating, we realized we were somewhat polar opposites when it came to politics. <laughs> so it's like, sure. you know what? We could talk about anything, but we'll just maybe leave politics off the table. And uh, right. now, now we're pretty much aligned, uh, seeing as the kind of crazy climate we're in. But it is funny how certain topics like that just, uh, you know, you almost have to create kind of a no-go space. But money is one one of those places you can't not go like you have to go into right. this it's just it's such day-to-day -day practical stuff that you have to deal with you've got you've got to handle it at some point and i i don't know if you've ever read the book um a new earth or uh, by eckhart tolle but he just did this whole series with oprah um, and it's a wonderful podcast that you can go listen to. But essentially, you know, when we start to talk about the ego, we start to talk about the way we view ourselves. And if someone is um, talking against that, uh, it, it can hurt our ego. So there's definitely some deep seated, <laughs> some <laughs> deep seated personality and deep seated psychological things to work on. And so usually when I work with couples, you know, the, the first thing we do is we set goals, but to make them common goals. So it's, you know, we're starting on common ground and then we'll start to dig into the details of exactly how to do everything. And that's uh, and usually by then we're, there's not very many arguments. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, you shared with me this this funny story. I have to repeat it so we can maybe dive into it a little bit. You shared that one day your wife came home from Target, which, of course, is the place yes. where all money goes. And she had a bunch of shopping bags and you thought from the couch, like, you know, what the F did she buy this time? Which is yep. a, a common <laughs> feeling that a lot of people have. And then you thought but wait, you know, you, you need to never have that thought again. But yes, how can we how, how you know, when you work with couples, like how can you practically get to that place? Because that is something for so many people that is like this, this irking pain. Mm -hmm. And them. it's like, what is she buying or what is he buying? <laughs> and you just you almost lose your mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and I wrote uh, an article about this story and I posted it on Reddit, the, the personal finance subreddit one day, uh, and it ended up getting to the front page of Reddit, which was phenomenal. And, you know, wow. I, and there were a couple comments in there about like, oh, you're trying to control your spouse. You're trying to control your wife and what she spends. And honestly, that wasn't it at all. Really, what happened was I realized when she came home and had bought all those things, I started to also think about, well, what have I bought? You know, what what money do we have coming in? How do we know we're not how do we know if we're going farther into debt or not? How do we how can we get together and just make sure we don't drop the ball, make sure we're, you know, we're paying attention uh and 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 how do we do that together? And that's really what started my journey into looking into personal finance and budgeting and apps and all that all that good stuff. And so, you know, when you talk about how do we start that journey, really, it's to start and thinking to say, okay, we are a team. We are right. a family. We are a couple now. How do we get together with our money? It's not your money and my money anymore. It's our money. Uh, and even if you think differently, the courts might disagree with you in some states. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's our money. How are we going to handle this? How are, how are we just going to become a team? And there's, there's an infinite number of ways to do it, too. For sure. Yeah. So what do you find are some of the besides this topic, like what are some of the trickiest subjects that we avoid talking about when it comes to money with our spouse or significant other? Are there like some topics that you just see emerge over and over again or some conversations or arguments that always rise mm -hmm. to the top? 
Well, fortunately, my couples, they don't argue a whole lot anymore. But that's good. The, the, you know, the biggest conversation piece and where we really start to you start to see those wheels start to grind again against each other um, is when we get away from the common goals like we want to buy a house or we want to get out of debt or uh, some of those bigger goals. We want to talk about retirement. And then we start to get into the personal things like I want to buy a guitar. I want to buy this purse. I want to go here on vacation or, or he wants to go there on vacation. That's where we start to get uh, when you start to get away from the couple and the family and into the individual things is how do we balance uh, and, and manage our money so that we're going after our joint goals. But also, you know, I'm still an individual. I and I'm talking about me personally, Dan, I love video games. I'm going to buy the next Xbox whenever it comes out or, or the next <laughs> PlayStation. Uh, and my wife is just huge into everything Disney. And so she wants to go to Disney World. Well, I like it too. So that's, you know, that's fun <laughs> together. But, you know, I'm looking here, uh, you know, around my house and the purses that she has and the clothes that she has, which isn't my thing. But, you know, going back to that whole control thing is how do we manage money so that she gets to have her fun, I get to have my fun, and we we get to have our joint fun together for date nights and vacations and, and whatnot, but also go after those common goals. So the, the, that's where the biggest conversations start to have is to say, OK, <laughs> we're getting into those fight areas of uh, individuality. That's really where that, the, the, the wheels start to grind against each other. Have you seen the stories lately? I've seen on a couple different news networks where there's the trend now of solo honeymoons. So, Oh, yeah, I did see that the other day. Which is just crazy to me. It's like, OK, we just got married, but now you go <laughs> vacation where you want to and I'm going to go vacation where I want to. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, like I understand <laughs> what's behind that. But sure. wow, that just to me is, is, is yeah. starting off on an interesting foot. <laughs> Right, right. Well, and I, yeah, it is very interesting. And, you know, for, for my wife and I, we, uh, as soon as we got, as soon as the wedding was over, I actually went into training with Edward Jones and I was a financial advisor for two years. Uh, and so we didn't really have a full honeymoon ourselves. We, you know, we live in the panhandle of Florida. So we kind of did a staycation in a different town, but it was still here, uh, you know, in the panhandle of Florida. And so um, that was really nice. But with that solo, well, and actually, sorry, let me go back. My brother-in-law just got married, and they're not going on a honeymoon anytime soon either. They're, you know, they're planning to do a uh, vacation. They're planning to do a honeymoon, I think, a cruise eventually. But they've got to save up some vacation time as well. And so, sure. yeah, it it is quite interesting how with, and I did take a vacation on my own because I wanted to go to DC. I'd never been to D.C. I'd never seen the monuments. I'd never been to any of the, the museums and whatnot. Uh, and I asked my wife if she wanted to go. She's like, nah, I've been there, done that. I, you just go. And I had a great time. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> like, you know, I went where I wanted to go. I, I saw what I wanted to see. I ate when I wanted to eat. And I went home and, and you know, went to bed uh, at the end of a long day walking around museums. And it was fantastic. So I definitely see the appeal. Um, but it's up to each individual couple is to say, well, you know, what makes you happy and, and what can you fit and what can you afford? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just think it's it's a interesting. It's like one of those things that, that makes you go, hmm, this is fascinating. Yeah. How, how is this going to work or how is this going to, you know, and I think what's great, like what you just said about your trip. I mean, I've certainly done that myself. Like as long as you're in agreement with your significant other and spouse and you don't let it be a, a dividing line between you, then of course, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'm a big fan of keeping individuality, especially in money too, because you're right. You've got to have those areas that you just like to do this and you have to allocate money so that each person is feels like their needs have been met. Yes, yes. But also to have the, each of them has a seat at the table and exactly. that they've talked about it and discussed it at, as a couple as well. And so once you come to that decision jointly, it's wonderful. And, you know, I, I, I wrote this ultimate guide. It's a 20,000 word guide on how you can start talking with your spouse about money. And part of that uh, ebook is to talk about not only, you know, have those discussions, have those budget meetings, have those money dates and whatnot. Uh, but it's also okay if the work 
is 90-10 as long as the decisions are 50-50. Because, you know, for me and my wife, I'm a money nerd. Uh, so, and Shauna, I'm sure you can relate to this as I well. I don't know is what that... you're talking about. <laughs> and, you know, I, I do most of the budgeting and, the, and, the, and all the financial work. I did our own taxes and whatnot, but I like to do it. I don't mind doing it. And my wife is perfectly happy to let me do it. Um, but when there are any changes to the budget, if we have any big decisions to make, it's, you know, a five-minute conversation or we say, hey, we need to talk about the budget tonight or we need to do something. Um, you know, we talk about everything together, even though I do most of the work. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's such a great point because I have had a lot of friends and you might have had the same where they'll say to me, well, we're getting married, but we're not going to combine our money and I'm mm -hmm. going to pay X expenses and he's going to or she's going to pay X expenses, but one of us makes more. And so, yeah. we, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. And I, I think, well, how is that really going to work? I mean, it works out when things are really good, but it yeah. doesn't work out when things are not good, where let's right. say one of you gets sick or hurt and you can't work, then what happens is the other spouse just say, well, sorry, <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to help you out. And and I find that in in theory, a lot of those uh, setting up systems that way works really well. But I always want to make sure that people have thought about, well, what happens when things aren't going so well? How are yes. we going to do this? Because uh, uh -huh. I, I think you would agree that's an important conversation to have. Yeah. And actually, that reminds me, I've been uh, listening to the West Wing Weekly and rewatching old West Wing episodes. And there's one where uh, the president is is sick. Uh, you know, I don't want no spoiler alerts, but he's sick. <laughs> and his the first lady is helping him put his pants on just, you know, they're sitting at the bed. And um, and, you know, he's he's pretty embarrassed because he's the president and this has never happened to him before. And as they're going along, he looks down and says, this is why they make you take vows, isn't it? And she looks up and, you know, she almost starts to choke up. And she said, yeah, this is why they make you take vows. And so, you know, it, it's it's the downtimes that you re really want to be aware of. And that's where you want to be a, a team. So, you know, when you s talked about splitting up the expenses, like, well, you know, I make 75% of the income, so I pay 75% of the bills. That works pretty well if you're roommates uh, and you really just want to make things even because you don't really have a contract together otherwise. But once you're engaged and really once you're married and you have that legal contract and you you both have uh, dove into becoming a team, becoming a family, that's where it needs to stop being your money and my money. And, and, and it's not needs to start being our money. Uh, because at some point, you know, if Certainly, if you're going to be a stay-at-home mom or you're going to be a stay-at-home dad, is that if one of you isn't bringing in income, you're still providing value. Uh, and so you still need to be part of the team. You still need to have a seat at that table. So, yeah, I agree. It's uh, trying to split up the bills that way isn't quite the, the mindset that you need to have when you're getting into this, this new situation. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, -N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news 
Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The host, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away, and back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So much more to come from Dan after this Ask Shauna from Jenny, who says, I have two credit-related questions for you. I'm in my mid-20s and I've made so many money mistakes growing up. Even though I wasn't taught about money and how a credit card works, once I was in college, I still never tried to learn. Now I'm trying to rectify those mistakes and have much healthier money habits. As a result, I'm working on raising my credit score, which is currently under acceptable, into poor credit. I have defaulted on a credit card in the past and I'm making payments on it currently. Should I keep it open once I pay it off or should I close it? I was also listening to your recent podcast about credit card benefits and points. While I don't intend to open a new card anytime soon, I was curious all the same. Is there a credit card with good rewards that you are aware of for those of us with lower credit scores? Thank you, and I love your podcast. Listening to your podcast has been an integral part of my motivation and confidence that I can turn my finances around. I really appreciate all you do. Jenny, I'm so right there with you, honestly, in regards to money mistakes. And I would imagine that just about everybody else that's listening is probably shaking their head, yes. (laughs) Don't even spend another second even worrying about them. They are in the past. Let's move on to the future. Are you with me? And I think that's actually a really important message. I know I talk about that a lot, but 
you can really feel in isolation about your money mistakes. Like nobody else could have possibly done the thing that you did. Like it, you're thinking this was the most ridiculous, stupid thing. Like I, you're smarter than this, but I guarantee you that thousands of other people that are listening have probably made the exact same mistake or some version of the mistake. So I always just attribute that to we don't talk about money, so we feel really siloed. But when we can share these stories with everybody listening, hopefully you can feel like you're not in a silo and that also it's not a big deal. Just take whatever mistakes that you've made and you really have to put them in the garbage can. And I cannot say that enough because I spent a few years really – digging in the dirt with my mistakes and they kept coming up over and over again and stopping me from doing different things and really stopping me from having an ownership over what I know about money. And that's not a healthy place for me. It's not a healthy place for you. You are much smarter than you're giving yourself credit for. So I would just first off tell you whatever mistakes are plaguing you, just throw them away, burn them. I don't care what symbolic ritual you have to do. Just get that crap out of your head because from today forward, it's all about going forward. And it's not to say you're not going to make mistakes again, but we can make them with just a really healthy mindset of like, okay, I made the mistake. No big deal. Now what do I do? Where do I go from here? So with that said, credit score issues, they really plague a lot of us at some point in time. Again, this is something that most people don't talk about, but this is an actual reality. So you're not alone, but you're doing the work that it's going to take to get you there. So really congrats to you. But I would suggest, in my opinion, keeping that credit card that you're paying off open only because it keeps your credit utilization up, which is a huge factor in your credit score, the number two factor in your credit score. So closing accounts can negatively impact your credit utilization. And remember, credit utilization is just that difference between credit available and credit used. But it also could impact your credit history if you close the piece of credit that was, let's say, your very first piece of credit that started that credit history for you. It could also negatively impact you in that way. So I'm a big fan of just pay it off, keep it open. You can shred it. You can put it in the freezer. You can do whatever the heck you need to do with that credit card not to actually charge anything on it. But keep it open because it it helps keep your credit score healthy. And you never know. I mean, having a backup credit card available to you in times when maybe you just need to access that for something, emergency that comes up, it's not a bad idea. One move that a lot of people use is actually to get a secured credit card where you have to put a small deposit down, but other than that, the credit card works just like a normal credit card, but it helps you build a better credit score if you have negative credit as long as you make those payments on time. And this is one of the best ways I've found to raise your credit score in a reasonably short amount of time. So talking about rewards credit cards, really uh, most rewards credit cards exist for those with healthy credit scores. Most require at least a 660 score, but really anything over 700 is the sweet spot. It's where you can really start to apply to those cards without being denied. So my two cents, I just say, wait until you raise up your score to somewhere around 700. And then I would head over to NerdWallet or CreditCards.com or some site like that where you can see what cards would be best for your credit score, those rewards cards. But I would say focus right now on doing the hard work, paying those payments on that defaulted credit card, maybe getting a secured credit card to boost your credit score up, but just keep doing what you're doing now. Keep focusing on the good, healthy mindset. And before you know it, your score is actually going to move up into that great range. And then you're going to be able to have all those amazing rewards, points, perks, all of that good stuff. So hopefully, Jenny, that's helped you out a little bit. Again, I would just focus on congratulating yourself for really taking ownership over this and get rid of anything that is not serving you in your mindset, any of those mistakes, just throw them in the trash can because honestly, that is where those things belong. (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah, such a great point. And of course, me being a money nerd, just like yourself, when my husband and I got married, it was pretty much understood that I would be taking care of the budget and and the other really day to day money tasks. Because again, Mm -hmm. that's what I enjoy. That's where my expertise is. And he just like your wife, he's totally fine. You please go do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, before you even started to work with couples when you and your wife got married, was there a system you had to work out between both of you when it, when it came to money? Or did things just kind of fall into place? Or did you have any of those tricky conversations? That's a good question. Um, you know, the, fr- the starting out was a bit of a bumpy road because, you know, I, I basically kind of decided we need to start budgeting and I kind of dragged my wife along with us. And and one thing that she was worried about, she she doesn't remember saying this, but I remember it clear as day, uh, is she was – we were talking about, you know, saving money for or, – or putting money in the budget for toiletries and, you know, having – trying to have a balanced budget and, and putting the budget into place. And she said, well – if we run out of money in the toiletries and we need toothpaste, I can't buy toothpaste. You know, that was <laughs> – <laughs> it was kind of one of those simple things. And honestly, I didn't have an answer the moment she asked that question. But, you know, that was something that we figured out. And we're pretty loosey-goosey when it comes to our budget. Is is it's a plan and we try to live by it through the month. But honest to goodness, as long as we're – putting money towards our goals and we're not going further into debt, which really is one of our goals. Um, Everything else in between, if we go over budget, we'll pull the money from some other account. Or if we're under budget, you know, we've got money to play with. We we try to have that room in our budget uh, to as we go. And so, you know, that was one thing. Um, And also, we didn't uh, combine all of our bank accounts or anything right away. We got used to just the habit of talking having the habit of keeping track of things and talking about our goals. And it really wasn't until we bought our house that we're like, okay, well, we're moving and there's a a different bank that's closer to the house. So while we're moving, we might as well just combine all of our accounts into one spot. And so it made our lives easier, uh, but we already had the habits ingrained and, and, and the joint accounts really became just a logistical, it made things easier. Yeah, that and that makes sense. And I think that's what a lot of people do. And and you're you're so spot on with the conversation leading with the conversation point. And I'm just curious, because you talked uh, a little bit about goals and, and how you work with other couples and, and helping to set goals. What sort of advice would you give to somebody who's maybe engaged or they're thinking about getting engaged and they really haven't gone into this topic yet around money and setting mm-hmm. goals like what sort of starting point should they start off on to to maybe come up with some of these joint goals sure uh well i think the best thing to do is to basically sit down with your spouse or or if you're about to be engaged or you're engaged and say hey let's let's talk about money we don't have to make any decisions but what is it about money that you're worried about? What is it? Um, what do you think about retirement? What does that mean to you? And and really just explore the topic just to get a, a general sense of what your um, significant other wants and what you want, and just just to explore that topic. That's really the first place you do. So when I work with my couples specifically, I have them each just go off into a room and set a five minute timer on their own uh, and write down as many things that they can think about money as possible. So retirement, debt, vacations, things they want to buy, Teslas, you know, <laughs> any, anything and everything that they want with money. And if they can't think of it within five minutes, it's not important or it, maybe it'll come up someday. Um, and then with that giant list, I have them. And this is in the guide as well. Um, just pick a top five. Here, one, two, three, four, and five of, of this giant list. These are the five most important to me. And then they come together and I say, okay, now as a couple – you're going to create a top 10 list. So, you know, his five and her five, or, or if you're a same sex couple, you know, if you take both sets and you're going to, everybody gets their goals onto one list, but you have to rank them. You have to rank them one through 10. There can't be any ties. The good news with that is most of the time when that happens, great couples have already talked about something at some time that they, they you know, they want to pay for the wedding. That's going to be maybe one of the, the key goals right away, but then they want to buy a house. And so that top 10 list ends up being more like a top eight or a top six. And, and it shows that they're already thinking pretty well on the same page what they want for their lives. 
Right. So then it's just about getting the money then to come around and support those goals once they've figured mm-hmm. out this is the the list and the order maybe we want to do these in. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm a big fan of starting high level because I think – and probably anyone listening to this, it's probably already happened to you is like, oh, I need to keep track of my money. And so you download Mint or you get every dollar or YNAB and you start tracking things. But – uh, you start with the nitty gritty details and it's boring and frustrating <laughs> and and you give up. And so that's why, especially and especially with engaged couples, is that you're trying to do three things at the same time. A, you're trying to learn how to manage money just in general. Number two, you're trying to figure out how to be a married couple. And then number three, you're trying to learn a new piece of software uh, most of the time or, or an app. And so when something goes wrong, you're not really sure what one of those three things it is. Uh, And so rather than diving straight into the software or diving straight into the, the the logistics and how to exactly do things, we start high level. We just talk about your dreams and your fears, and then we start to put numbers on them to say, okay, well, how much does that dream cost? Uh, and then once we have an idea to say, okay, this is what you want and this is how much it costs, how much does it cost to be you every month? You know, how much uh, does it take to live your life every day? And how can we fit these goals in or, or can we? And and the conversation goes from there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think number two out of your out of your three lists, just learning how to be a married couple. That is hard work in itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a new thing. And, and, and you know, and marriage and, and that deep relationship uh, takes some work. And so, you know, it's certainly if you are already living together, maybe you figured out the whole laundry and dish, you know, doing the dishes situation. But still, it's it's, you know, um, especially if one of you is making decisions with your family, but not including your significant other on vacation plans or something to that effect. It's just like, hey, you know, you forgot about me. And, and so little things that you figured out as you go. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you mentioned your your ebook how to talk about money with your spouse, the ultimate guide. Are mm-hmm. there any other maybe one or two little gems that you can pull out and and talk about maybe things we haven't thought about when it comes to money with relationships? Sure. Um I think the the next biggest question is really the joint accounts. Um and you know, my even my brother-in-law that just got married texted me. He's like, "Hey, do you got anything on this?" I'm like, "Yes, I have this whole guide <laughs> that talks about it." And maybe I'll I'll write a whole another guide just on combining accounts and if you should or or whatnot. Um but that Reddit post that I mentioned, after reading comment after comment, there were hundreds of comments on it. And what I found out is that there are many, many, many successful marriages uh, and, and couples that have dealt with money that have everything separate. And there are successful marriages where everything is joint. And there are successful marriages where there's a little bit in between. And so what I gleaned from uh, all of those comments and all that information is that really when it comes to joint accounts is uh, just try something. Figure out what works for you because it's really just the logistics. What's most important is a communication, is that you've got to be talking about money. Don't leave each other out on large decisions. Um, that's number one. I guess another gem is uh, you've got to have some fun money. <laughs> you've got to have some money in your plan, in your budget, uh, in your spending plan, so that way you, as an individual, have some money that you get to do whatever you want with every month. If you've got friends that you want to go out and have a drink with or go out to lunch with, uh, go for it. Um, you know, If there's something you want to go buy, just go buy it. And so you have that little bit of uh, individuality. But the great news is if you set uh, a limit on it or if you set an amount, then you both also know as long as you don't go over that limit, your big goals are still going to be okay. You're still going to pay the bills and there's that comfort. And that you know kind of comes back full circle to my wife and her coming home from Target uh, with all those bags. I don't care anymore. I just don't. It doesn't matter what she walks in the door with, um, what bag she does, because we've been doing this every month for seven, eight years now. And I know that, you know, we're going to be fine. We're going to figure it out. We're a great team. And I and I stopped caring. And so that's really what I want to get, you know, all the couples that I work with is if you're scared of having those fights and, and what's going to happen in the future, if you start this habit early, you're going to be fine. And that's such a good point because you can set the dollar amount of we have $100 or $200 each a month, whatever that dollar amount is for you Mm -hmm. in your relationship. But you also have to come alongside with that with 
I'm not going to berate you about your purchases. I'm not going to ask you about your purchases in a negative way. Yes. So if we set this dollar amount, look, we're both handshaking. We're agreeing that as long as you don't go over, go fine, go spend it on whatever you want. And I can't butt in and you can't butt in. And I think that if you bring that piece along with it, you can really, like just you said, come to a happy place about this. Yes, yes. And, and I've also found that when it comes to working with money and, and putting a plan together is it's it's very similar to, you know, writing um, a book or coming up with a good joke is that the first time you do it, it's going to be terrible. It's going <laughs> to suck. Uh, it's not going to be very fun, but it, it's a habit and a skill that you can build over time. And, you know, you're talking about uh, not questioning the the payments. You know, it's uh, since I do most of the organizing. Uh, then, you know, I'll ask my wife, hey, you know, what was this? Uh, you know, what did you buy at Target or what did you buy at this? Um, but it's just to make sure it's categorized right. <laughs> just, to, just to make sure we're tracking it right. And she knows that I'm not asking in, in a judgy fashion. It's I'm just asking to make sure everything's organized. And it takes some practice to do that. But it's also uh, up to each of you to, you know, if you need information or you need to ask a question is to say, well, whatever the answer is, is to not overreact either. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, that's such a great point. I'm just curious, what led you in the direction to wanting to work with couples? around their money? Is this something you've been passionate about for a while? Or did you just find yourself in this space and think, okay, this is the place I need to be? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I I have always, well, not always. So I guess my background is I actually have an electrical engineering degree. That's that's, that's my wow. bachelor's. But then I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I went the I got an MBA as well. And that's where I fell in love with finance. Uh, I, I loved finance, everything about it. I was already, you know, had a, a mind for numbers, but now finance had, you know, the strategy that went with it. And as I mentioned before, I was I was a financial advisor for a couple of years. But I really realized that wasn't quite the career path for me, but I still loved talking about money, helping people with money, helping families make decisions with money. And so I started to look at the personal finance route. Um, but, you know, in the world of the Internet, you've really got to become targeted and, and pick a niche and pick a, a tribe that you want to lead uh, some, you know, a group of people that you really want to help. And well, I, my wife and I, we don't have kids yet. We have a dog. Um, and so that's that's nice, but it's not quite the same as kids. And so really, when it comes to my expertise, I was like, well, you know, my wife and I have been doing fine at this for years. Maybe I can help others. And, you know, I, I put that hook in the water and started fishing and, and people are like, yeah, yeah, I, I want help with that. And it's just kind of grown from there. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I, I love when that happens, when it just sort of organically grows out of this feels right. This is a good place. Yeah, yeah. It's I And I wanted to help someone and I and I found I found my group I, it, it, I found my tribe <laughs> for sure for sure wow well so many great tips Dan I, I love this I love talking about couples but if you could leave us with maybe one piece of advice about how to get along with your spouse around money how to have these good money conversations what would it be yes I I think the the one piece of advice is to be Willing to make mistakes and to forgive is that your your significant other is going to make mistakes and you need to forgive them and they need to forgive you for your mistakes. You're, you're going to make them as well. And to really come into dealing with money and managing money, don't look at it as math and that there's a statistically correct answer. Um, look at it, as I said before, as, as you're crafting a joke or you're crafting a piece of art or a, a, a piece of writing, is that it's going to take versions. It's going to take time. Uh, and the good news is that you know if, if you set a plan for the month and it doesn't go well, you just restart the next month. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you, you get a fresh start all the time. Uh, but in the end, you really need to have those conversations. Uh, don't procrastinate on that. Just start talking about it. And eventually you'll be all right. Exactly. You'll take the training wheels off. And before you know it, you'll be right in without the wheels. I love it. Yes. So Dan, tell everybody where they can find you and how they can get the ebook, How to Talk About Money with Your Spouse. 
Yes, if you'd like to download that 20,000 word guide for free, you can go to adultingwithmoney.com slash MM. So that's adultingwithmoney.com slash MM for, stands for millennial money. Um, and that's where you can uh, get that guide for free. Uh, if you want to find more about me, just go to adultingwithmoney.com. You can find me there. Uh, Facebook, I'm at adultingwithmoney. And Twitter, it's adultingwmoney because apparently adulting with money is too long of a username. So, <laughs> so if you're looking for for me on Twitter. It's a slight difference, uh, and that's where you can find me. Hey, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. It's absolutely free, and you'll make sure you never miss an episode of Millennial Money. You can also listen to all our episodes on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, and Pandora. 